I'd like to welcome you all to our day of sustainability, where we're taking stock of the year of sustainability at Bilkent uh, University. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you, our rector, Sayın Professor Dr. Abdullah Atalar, our keynote speaker, Sayın uh, Hakan Bulgurlu, Bulgurlu uh, değerli hocalarımız, dear professors, uh, my colleagues, our students, welcome all. Um, as Bilkent University, we have declared and dedicated the year, academic year of 2021-22 as a focal year on sustainability and climate change. Our thinking being, uh, as a leading university in Turkey, Bilkent could, even should, assume a leading role to contribute toward leading discussions, generating ideas on sustainability, and of course, posing an example as is our tradition. And as an edu uh, educational institution, we are tasked for with this by the United Nations, nonetheless. Um, the sustainable development goals were adopted in the year 2015. The notion of sustainability has been with us for longer, but the sustainable development goals have been with us since 2015. And we took our cue from the goals set by the UN. Um, and throughout the year, what we have done, our respective faculties and departments have taken several initiatives, including seminar series. We have dedicated courses or sometimes lectures within courses and focused wherever possible our graduation, student graduation projects on this, on the topics related to sustainability. I'll be reporting on their progress in the third part of today's program. We'll begin by um, welcome and an introduction by our rector, Professor Abdullah Atalar, which will be followed by our keynote speaker, Sayyid Hakan Ulgurlu. And as I said last, I'm going to talk a little bit about the kind of progress that our faculties and our students have uh, made over the years. We have asked ourselves, how can we help achieve the sustainable development goals? And I'll report on our progress as part of the third, as the third part of our program today. Um, without further ado, I'll give the floor to uh, Professor Atalar Bojam. The floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Dear participants of this uh, sustainability meeting, uh, I welcome you all uh, to this meeting organized by the Faculty of Economics, Administrative and Social Sciences. Uh, I also thank wholeheartedly our esteemed guest, Hakan Bulgurlu, CEO of Archelik, for accepting to give the keynote speech. Uh, in my uh, short talk, I will uh, give you information on uh, what we are doing uh, to reduce our carbon footprint and establish sustainability in the university. Uh, I will tell you some of the things that we are doing and planning. As you may know, we produce our electricity on campus from the turbines powered by natural gas uh, as a byproduct of the electricity generation. We produce hot water, which is used to heat the buildings of the main campus. Uh, by the way, as you all know, uh, natural gas has gotten very expensive these days. And our electricity cost is uh, electricity bill uh, is tripled in the last six months. So it's become a significant portion of the university's budget. Uh, it's approaching 10% of our budget. Uh, when we construct uh, new buildings or renovate the old buildings, we try to improve the heat insulation in those buildings. Uh, we do our best in that direction. For example, the new dormitory building that recently uh, uh, been uh, recently constructed has many energy saving features. Uh, the, the building has triple layer glass windows with argon gas between layers. 
this gives a much better insulation than a double layer glass. Heat insulation material in the walls is uh, uh, two and a half times thicker than what the standard requires. As a result uh, of these uh, investments, we can use less hot water to heat the building. The same building, the windows in the rooms can open from the top and bottom simultaneously, enabling a cross ventilation during the summer. This reduces the temperature in the room by about three to four degrees uh, without a need for energy consuming air conditioners. Moreover, the building's uh, central ventilation system is equipped with a heat rec recovery feature, again, saving energy. The same uh, dormitory building has a gray water system. What's a gray water system? Uh, wastewater from the basins and showers are kept separate from uh, the wastewater of the toilets. Uh, so this uh, relatively clean wastewater is called gray water. And after the sanitation, the, the same gray water is safely used for watering the green areas in the campus. As you may also know, our swimming pool near the dormitories uses solar panels to heat the uh, uh, pool water instead of the available uh, hot water that we generate uh, from uh, natural gas. In the campus, we collect the autumn leaves, mold grass, and trimmed tree branches. We collect them and compost them to enrich the soil in different parts of the campus. Uh, we also collect the garbage in the campus very carefully. Uh, we classify them according to the standards, and then they are collected by licensed companies. Rainwater in the campus is collected from the roofs and roads, and this rainwater is directed toward our reservoir. Then, as you know, we use the reservoir, reservoir's water to water the uh, lawns and green areas throughout the summer. We are also considering green roofs for their good heat insulation properties in addition to their much better looks uh, in some of the new buildings. For example, the new Bliss Sports Hall currently under construction will be covered with a green roof. Green roof meaning um, there will be soil on top of the uh, roof instead of uh, the regular roof materials. And it provides, it's, you can grow plants on it. Of course, it also provides much better insulation for the building. In the last few years, we changed the exterior lighting systems for, from sodium lamps to low energy consuming LED bulbs therefore reducing our electricity consumption. In the just uh, last few months, we reduced our electricity consumption by about 9% compared to three years ago. I'm using the numbers of three years ago since it is before the pandemic. It represents a better uh, base level. And we reached this 9% number of uh, uh, consumption, consumption reduction with the cooperation of the whole university. Everybody turned off non-essential lights and we turned off some of the street lights. In my office, I'm turning uh, many of the lamps and, uh, you know, the... Uh, hallway in the uh, in our office in our office floor most of the lamps are turned off so we are able to save uh, by the university the whole university cooperation about nine percent and that's a significant portion soon uh, 
by the end of the summer, I'd say, we will install solar panels over uh, some parking lots to generate our electricity. Solar panels will not generate all the electricity we need, but it will be something like a 10% to 15% contribution to our uh, electricity uh, uh, consumption. What can you do in reducing our uh, carbon uh, footprint? Some suggestions. When your room is too hot, turn down the radiator instead of opening the windows. When not necessary, turn off the lights. Remove the chargers from the plug when not in use. Turn off your computers when not in use. Never use electric heaters. They are big consumers. When the room is not so warm, instead of complaining to the uh, management, wear a sweater. Well, with this... Uh, <laughs> Uh, remark. Uh, I'd like to uh, finish uh, my uh, introductory speech. I hope this uh, meeting will help increase our awareness about global warming. I am uh, very grateful to the organizer of this meeting. Thank you very much. Hocam, teşekkür ederiz. Thank you. As since the beginning of the academic year, we have organized efforts um, in twofold manner. Uh, our provost, uh, Professor Adnan Akai, has been meeting with our deans, uh, coordinating their efforts. And I have been meeting with our faculty representatives um, to coordinate their efforts as well. I'd like to introduce them to you now. Um, many of them are with us at the moment. This is our team. I took this uh, screenshot uh, during our uh, final meeting as we were preparing uh, this May 12th presentation. Um, our colleague David Thornton was not with us on the day uh, for personal reasons. So uh, upon Jenny Hoja's su suggestion, I photoshopped uh, his photo <laughs> onto this one. You, you can tell that I was not hired for my photoshopping abilities, but I did my best um, uh, nevertheless. So this is our team. We've been meeting since the beginning of the uh, academic year, uh, coordinating our efforts and preparing um, for um, this um, day as well. I'm going to introduce our keynote um, speaker to you, but uh, I don't think he has joined us um, yet. So in the meantime, let me just uh, give you an idea as to what is um, what, what is uh, coming uh, as well. Um, our faculty representatives have been very hard at work, and what we've been doing was has been to ask ourselves a number of um, key questions. Um, and these are the questions that we have asked ourselves since the beginning of the academic year. And uh, our rector, Professor Atalar, already outlined some of the things that we can do as individuals. So one of the things that we've asked ourselves was to what uh, was the things that we can do as individuals, individual beings. And I'm going to share with you the kinds of suggestions that my colleagues have generated over the last few months. The second thing that we did was to organize on things that we can do as a community. So things that go beyond our individual capacity, things that we need to collaborate on uh, to be able to able to turn into reality. So that's the second uh, task, the second focus uh, of our, our, our meetings and our efforts. The third thing that we've asked over the months is what we, can we do for the rest of the society? As a university, we are trained and we specialize in research, of course, that's the fourth focus, right? But of course, there are other things that we can do to contribute to the society at large in terms of informing them, in terms of setting an example, um, and, and uh, hoping to inspire others as well. So um, the uh, another part of my presentation will look at what we have uh, achieved and of course, hoping to achieve in the coming months in terms of uh, not only informing the rest of the society, but also but but also um, in, hoping to in, inspire them uh, by our by setting an example um, as well. What I can do is to very 
quickly talk about some of the things that I was planning to talk about afterwards so that we make use of, make, make use, good use of our time, right? I can do that um, and make a little bit further progress on this. Um, the quickest uh, um, um, summary is prepared by Jenny Lane Hoja from Faculty of Education. Let me share my screen here once again. Uh, what, when we ask ourselves what we can do as individuals, uh, David Thornton Hoja from our faculty, Faculty of Economics, Administrative and Social Sciences, and Jenny Lane Hoja from Education, uh, prepared a, a quick summary of four slides outlining what we can do, of course, as teachers in the classroom. Right. These are their suggestions. I'm not going to read them out to you. What we're going to do is to invite our deans to consider whether they would like to share them in their respective buildings on TV screens or in any other medium that they see fit so that our faculty and our students can, um, can look at them and consider things that they can do beyond what is already apparent uh, or obvious to them. So these are the things um, that we can do in the classroom without actually any input from the others. Individual action, in individual um, initiatives are available here. The next thing here is to consider what we can do in terms of affordable and clean energy. You can see that we are all looking, we're here considering the UNDP's goals, right? The logos are the goals as set by the UNDP. This is what can be done in terms of transportation. The third set of suggestions are about our consumption. How can we be responsible consumers? Again, there's quite a lot that we can do beyond that is immediately available or obvious to us in terms of our own thinking and practices. Finally, the fourth set of suggestions that come from our colleagues is regarding minimizing, if not getting rid of hunger worldwide. Again, these are suggestions. Some of you, them may already be a part of your practices, already rather obvious. Others may be more of a challenge depending on uh, how practiced each of us are regarding um, these United Nations um, sustainability goals. What we have done also in the past few months was to ask ourselves the second question, what can we do as Bilkent University community? Here, I'm going to share with you already what we have done but also what we are planning to do in the next um, few months. This is from the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. Students there had, have set up this corner to recycle used materials from their previous projects so that this valuable material does not go to waste, that they can recycle from one project onto the other. This is the initiative of the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. The next contribution comes from um, the initiative of Shule Hoja from the same faculty. This is the uh, tree planting activity the last weekend during Mayfest. You see that um, 63 trees were planted, 2000 250 kilogram of carbon potentially offset as part of their efforts. More photos from the same day. They received these electronic certificates. We did not give them per paper certificates. We, they received these electronic certificates as a memento of uh, what they have achieved. 
a little bit more on this. And finally, again, this is an initiative that started on this weekend, hopefully is going to continue um, further, is this recycling um, of materials beyond um, the uh, beyond art related material that I was talking about earlier today. Uh, there is this Instagram page, we'll share this via our web page as well, the Sustainable Weekend web page. There is this um, recycling corner that our students and staff, of course, faculty can use uh, to trade in their goods. And the best way we thought to do was to do via social media so that students can take a photo of what would they would like to trade uh, with the others. So this initiative is also alive and um, is available for the, um, for the use of our, um, our students and of course staff. Now, the final thing I'm going to talk about in terms of what we can do as a community is a future oriented one. Uh, our colleagues uh, went to visit Beitepe village thinking that our contribution to the society could begin with those who are closest to us geographically. Um, they went to visit Beitepe village um, and to establish community connections for sustainability. And um, they have identified what can be done, what we can do as the, in, in terms of the contribution are co contributing to restorating um, buildings and an ancient fountain in Beitepe village. And the idea is that these restoration ideas uh, are going to be integrated into courses um, next academic year, it was too late for this academic year, they're going to be integrated into courses in the next academic year. So hopefully our efforts are going to be continued, our sustainability efforts are going to be um, hopefully sustainable in the next uh, year or further um, years um, to come. This is the um, three, uh, two questions that I have um, outlined for you in terms of our contributions. Now, in terms of what we have done to inspire others, there is even more contribution that has come in here. What can we do to contribute to the society at large? This uh, contribution comes from, again, from the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. This is an exhibition organized, uh, co-organized by uh, our communication and design department. This exhibition was in Ankara a couple of weeks ago at Jer Modern very well received and is currently in Istanbul. Again, very well received exhibition. If you missed it, there are aspects of this work uh, online and we have shared on our webpage as well. Uh, what is very exciting about this exhibition is not only that the, um, the, the, the, they've been a part of it in terms of organization, but the artists were in residence in Ankara on our campus for a while. They worked together with our students and I have here um, some of the photos of the work that our students have done as in, in terms of their collaboration with the artists who were in residence on Bilkent University campus throughout the, uh, the spring semester. So more photos of this exhibition and especially the contributions by our um, students to the exhibition um, are going to be available on our, um, on our webpage as well. Um, let me uh, pause my presentation here, and then Very we'll good. continue um, after um, after our uh, keynote. Uh, Hakan Bey is here, Hocam, so we can get uh, started with our keynote. Okay, thank you. Teşekkür uh, ederim, Refet Hocam. It's my pleasure to welcome um, Sayın Hakan Bulgurlu, who's a leader in the business world and an uh, environmentalist as well. Uh, he's a head of Archilic, uh, where he's been um, CEO since 2015. He's uh, a graduate of the University of Texas, Austin, uh, and uh, with a degree in uh, economics and mechanical engineering. And he earned a BNBA degree of, uh, from Northwestern and Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Um, under his leadership, uh, Archilic has grown into an inclusive, sustainable, and uh, responsible, um, becoming carbon neutral, in global production with its own uh, carbon uh, credits. Um, Sayun Hakan Bulgurlu has been contributing to worldwide efforts as well uh, in terms of a transition to a low carbon economy. And he's recently joined the High Level Commission on Carbon uh, Pricing at the World uh, Bank. 
Uh, he's a most um, sought after speaker. So we are very privileged. We feel very privileged uh, to uh, welcome him um, as our keynote speaker today. We're not fun. Uh, Pranar Alam, thank you very much for having me uh, on this uh, talk. Uh, first of all, uh, what an amazing introduction. I only wish my wife was also listening. Might be a way to impress her. Refet, thank you very much for organizing, uh, having me here. Uh, except, you know, these talks I usually can do uh, relatively easily because I do them quite frequently. But because Refet is listening, I actually went and did my homework and prepared very carefully. Um, as he's spoken before several times, and I would hate to make a mistake in his presence. Um, it's an honor to speak uh, to the faculty uh, and also the students, because this is a, a, a critical, critical topic. And I think uh, not only sharing of information, but experiences is, is also important. But um, young people today are quite disenfranchised. They are locked out of this problem. And uh, so what you're doing actually is commendable. Uh, I think uh, only what, we, what I could wish for is that more universities followed your footsteps and, uh, uh, and would actually incorporate sustainability, especially the climate, into everything you do, from lectures, courses, projects, but also research, which I find is very important. Because every area that we operate in or that we live in as humanity, there are ways to mitigate um, and decarbonize uh, the economy. I'm going to get into this in, in detail. But I also want to, <clears throat> want to mention that uh, universities taking this on itself is not going to be enough. Uh, the UK uh, a few weeks ago announced that actually the climate and sustainability was becoming part of secondary education. Uh, basically, what we need to do is we need to educate our children from when they are born on how to consume, how to eat, how to treat the environment. Um, and, and we need to make them a part of what is happening because the impact ultimately that we are causing. Uh, and when I say we, I will shamefully uh, uh, be honest about it. It's basically mostly middle-aged men around the world. Of course, women are part of it too, but mostly men um, who have caused this problem. Uh, if you look at, uh, when, when I, I'll just give one example so you can understand what I mean. I'm 50 years old and uh, you know, born early 70s. And since the early 70s, we've lost about 68% of the biomass of wildlife on the planet, 68%. That is one generation, that is my generation. So I have to take responsibility for this. And so does everybody else that has actually been part of this destruction. Now, what is the problem with this? The children of today or the young people that are listening today are going to inherit that problem. And today they are not part of that solution. So to include them around the table when we're discussing this, um, actually, what you're doing is, I think, mission critical. People need to, younger people need to be more aware of the problem, what the solutions are, and why they have to understand why there's hope. Uh, but we need to, one thing we don't have is time. So we need to really be executing at the same time as educating young people. <clears throat> one more point. I also think in today's crowded markets with AI, you know, robotic process automation, uh, the economical tension, geopolitical tensions, those are different matters. But essentially, the job markets are very different than they were in the past. If a young person today uh, wants a secure job you know, in the coming years, a sure way to get that is to actually specialize in sustainability, decarbonization, mitigation of all of these um, uh, various impacts that we've had on the planet and the future of the planet and humanity. So I really think it, it makes good business sense um, in terms of return to younger people today to really study and specialize in sustainability and technologies uh, to mitigate uh, the impact of emissions. Now, um, uh, again, uh, I think uh, I will try and uh, share today, use the time carefully to, to talk a little bit about uh, what the outlook is in, in terms of climate uh, mitigation. And when I mean that, what, what are businesses doing, governments doing to try and, and counteract the emissions, which are still increasing, by the way, uh, today, and what that, that might mean for the future. Now, when I'm saying this, I really don't mean to scare anybody because that doesn't go anywhere. But I'd like to paint a realistic picture because often what you read is confusing and is far from reality. Um, it's basically a smoke and mirrors and play on statistics. So I will try and be realistic, and then I'll talk a little bit about the solutions. Now, why do we need climate uh, mitigation? 
Uh, first of all, I'm the CEO of an, of an appliance company, a major global appliance company. Many of you may not know, but we have 45,000 employees across the globe. Turkey is about 27% of our business today. We have factories in places like Bangladesh, Pakistan, South Africa, India, China, places which are difficult to operate and have very little regulation regarding environmental uh, impact. Uh, we manufacture about 50 million appliances a year, or manufacture or sell about 50 million appliances a year across the globe. So this means that um, uh, we basically uh, operate across a very different spectrum. I mean, we operate in Europe, which has high regulation and <clears throat> is a great example for the world, by the way, with the Green Deal. Or, you know, we sell luxury espresso machines in Europe, but we also sell a solar fridge to desperate people in, uh, in Africa. And we also sell air conditioners to India, by the way, which is an absolute necessity. And I'll talk about why it's an absolute necessity. Um, uh, air conditioning is an interesting problem because it's one of the biggest offenders in the world as a category in terms of energy consumption and carbon emissions. But at the same time, it's also absolutely necessary. You can't tell those people not to use them. I'll tell you why. Pakistan last week, this is very recent, saw 49.5 degrees in temperature. Uh, basically, dozens of people died of a stroke. Uh, states in India saw the highest temperatures I've ever seen, 43 degrees, um, basically the hottest March ever recorded. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about a, a concept which is very scary, but a, a wet bulb moment, uh, and it's, a, it's an interesting description, wet bulb is when you have a high temperature and high humidity at the same time. Essentially, if you have 32 degrees um, centigrade heat, and at the same time you have a high degree of humidity, what you feel is roughly 55 degrees of dry temperature. Now in Chennai, in India, uh, the wet bulb moments have already reached 30 degrees, which means essentially if you go outside, you can't survive. Um, and uh, of course, this means that they need air conditioning. This means that they need more power. That power is coal-fired, coming from coal-fired power plants. They can't source enough coal, coal. So basically across India last week, there were blackouts. And um, uh, at the moment, uh, basically, we're already at a, at a point where the impact of climate change is felt. Uh, and it's felt very strongly to the point where humans cannot live anymore in many parts of the world. So uh, we need to basically really take stock of that. What we're doing now, essentially, is saying the, the planet has already warmed by 1.2 degrees uh, since industrial times, since the mid-19th century. And we're saying we need to cap it by 1.5 degrees by 2100 if humans have a chance of survival. Now, if we don't do anything and we continue on the path we're continuing today, we're looking at a 2.7 degree warmer world. And this means basically an inhabitable uh, planet. Um, if we took the commitments made by countries at COP26 in Glasgow, uh, Glasgow was depressive and, and hopeful at the same time. I spent a lot of time and energy there. Um, we are looking at a 1.7 degree warmer world by 2100. This means basically uh, that uh, 1.7 degrees, sorry, that means that our current efforts are not enough. And much of the world as we know it today won't exist if we keep on this trajectory. So we need to do more. Now, I'll give you some examples because people don't usually link climate change to everyday problems they, they live through. <coughs> um, uh, TSMC, many of you know, is the world's largest chip maker. It's in Taiwan. And uh, it used 63 million tons of water in 2019 to produce chips. 63 million tons. Uh, when there was severe drought in the country, guess what happened? They couldn't produce enough chips. And today, you know, by the way, the screen you're watching today has multiple chips, the phone, everything, cars. And it looks like the chip shortage is going to continue to 2024. Not many people know that the chip shortage is caused mainly by a water shortage. Of course, demand also increased because of COVID, but this was the main reason. Um, another example, coffee. Everybody's basically addicted to coffee. By 2050, climate modeling shows that if we continue heating at the same rate, uh, Central America will not be able to support uh, coffee as a crop. That basically means that coffee supply collapses. We all know what happens with supply demand. So if you enjoy coffee, stockpile some in a vacuum, uh, in a vacuum bag or something. Um, but uh, uh, um, you know, taking it lightly, trying to take it lightly a little bit. But actually, 
um, the climate is causing all sorts of things. I mean, uh, everyone in the West at least thinks that the uh, problems in Syria happened because of sectarian uh, uh, uh, sects going at each other because of differences in religious thought. It was very simply just uh, extended drought, the worst that Syria had ever seen in the countryside and people in the countryside moving into the cities onto other people's lands. That's all. They were hungry. They didn't have food. They couldn't grow food. And that caused six, seven million refugees. It caused government change in Europe. We ended up with people like Orban, even though they got very, very few refugees. And Turkey ended up with four or five million refugees, which is a problem today, of course. Um, but that was small in comparison to what's waiting for us. I mean, if you look at just the Himakal Pradesh region, which produces almost all the water for uh, a, a region from India all the way to China, Southeast Asia. So Bangladesh, for example, is completely dependent on this water, 200 million people. 50% of the glaciers have gone. And the other 50% are projected to go between 30 to 50 years, depending <clears throat> this is not an exact science, by the way. That's why I always give a, a wider margin. And since you're all academics, I'm very careful with my numbers. Um, but uh, uh, most predictions say the rest will also disappear, which means around 2 billion people will get up, like in Syria, and move from their land because they cannot irrigate and grow crops onto other people's land. We're talking about distress and war at scales that have never lived, uh, that humanity has never, never lived before. This is, this is just a, a starker picture of what we're facing, but it's also very, very realistic. Um, and unfortunately, unless we all take action across the spectrum, uh, this is likely to happen. Now, um, also, of course, uh, we're all living through very complex uh, energy markets. And uh, basically, you know, energy security and what's happening in Syria with geopolitics are linked. But uh, essentially, moving away from fossil fuels is absolutely critical. And much of what was agreed was um, at COP26 was around decarbonizing. There were some problems around coal, which was eventually agreed to, uh, to some plan at least, but uh, uh, geopolitical problems are also now making it much harder for nations to reach that. I mean, today, the price of natural gas in Northern Europe has pushed inflation to insane numbers. 13.2 was the month to month inflation that I saw the um, year-to-year inflation that I saw in the Netherlands, for example. And simply that kind of inflation in the Eurozone is going to be very economically challenging to keep focusing resources um, on climate mitigation. Now, coming to decarbonizing, uh, well, there are many challenges here, uh, but there are also many opportunities. And I've shared a lot of the dark sort of prognosis with you at the moment. But I am a hopeful and I am an optimist. Uh, I'm a hopeful person. I'm an optimist at heart. Uh, I, um, I am an optimist. I, can, I mean, I can prove it to you. When I went to Glasgow in November in Scotland, I actually took my sunglasses with me. I mean, there's never sun in Glasgow. You know, people, people laughed at me. But that's how I tend to think, that uh, uh, even if reality is very stark, I believe that a way through will be found and luck is part of it as well. Um, and now, uh, this problem is, of course, a, a problem of such magnitude that it will take everything. Uh, what we have to do is we have to rapidly, immediately um, uh, decarbonize our economy. Every part of the economy, from production to consumption, even retail, transportation, needs to reduce emissions. And we need to create new low emission technologies and we need to basically redraw the map of how we operate uh, in the future. This is not, not very, very easy because, as I said, to a, in a backdrop where U.S. inflation is at 8.5%, this is much more uh, Refet's uh, uh, field. But to me, it's looking like Europe is facing uh, a severe crash, actually. Not even, uh, you know, the U.S. may manage a softer landing. But Europe, uh, exasperated by these geopolitical tensions, is facing a very, very difficult uh, couple of years ahead of us. When this is the case, and we know what's happening in Turkey with 70% inflation, it's going to be really difficult to focus on, on decarbonizing and giving it a priority and actually allocating capex to this. However, we absolutely have to do this today. There is there's no time. And um, as individuals, we have the responsibility, especially my generation, 
has the responsibility um, to do what they can. Now, uh, there's, there's a business case for this. When you look at uh, sort of simple, uh, very simple uh, polls uh, conducted by Simon Kushner or BCG, um, uh, you can clearly see that 60% of customers now are uh, actually making sustainability a part of their purchase criteria. This is very important. 85% said they changed their purchase behavior uh, because of this. And 50% of consumers have paid a premium actually to, um, to, to actually make sure their purchase and consumption habits were sustainable. The new generation coming, the young people I'm sure at the university listening to me today um, uh, understand the importance of this because in our capitalist system, <clears throat> the quickest way to transform something is when consumers vote with their money for products and services from companies that have been transformed already uh, against those that haven't transformed. And over time, I'm a true believer that uh, companies that have transformed today will be around in five years. And that's a very short time frame, actually, in a company's lifetime. Uh, and I believe that the companies that ignore this and, and, and don't transform will simply just uh, disappear. Now, if actually uh, uh, companies you know, are sustainable and they go through this transformation, we can clearly see from the World Economic Forum uh, and BCG that basically they outperform their competitors in every metric possible, from shareholder return to attracting talent to uh, reducing costs. I mean, basically, wherever you look, the business becomes a healthier business and gets a competitive advantage. And, um, you know, also, uh, by the way, uh, another metric, which is very important, I think, by the way, something important not to overlook here is also the cost of borrowing drops dramatically for companies that are climate friendly. Uh, and I'll give you the Archidic example uh, soon. But, um, uh, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we've seen global stock markets uh, shrink uh, and especially technology stocks retreating, but not just technology stocks, all stocks retreating. And this is because, of course, increasing interest rates. But at the same time, the amount of money earmarked for ESG funds uh, have grown dramatically. So essentially money is de-risking itself, smart money, capital, is de-risking itself by moving out of inflated assets and moving into a new area or a new frontier, which is basically sustainability. And, um, and they're, they're pouring in funds uh, into this. So uh, the numbers I've seen are quite uh, incredible, by the way. So if you, have, if you are a business that's transformed, you will find the capital that you need. If you are a business that has a very executable and, of course, checks out through a due diligence executable plan to decarbonize, you will find the necessary capital. And by the way, you'll probably find that capital cheaper than you would from a, from a normal uh, bank and a, and a trade line. What are we doing at, uh, <coughs> at Archie? <coughs> um, excuse me. I'm speaking a bit fast because I think uh, this kind of talk is more valuable when we leave some time for Q&A. Uh, Archeric, uh, years ago, decided to basically become uh, a leader in this area. And it's not always easy because you're not following someone else's footstop, uh, foot, uh, footsteps. You're basically creating, opening a path, and you're a first mover. And being a first mover sometimes is painful because you make mistakes uh, and you have to learn. Uh, Archeric went through this process early, uh, early in the whole ESG and sustainability journey. And we managed to create a roadmap, which we followed very diligently. But I think the most important uh, aspect of the transformation I want to share with you, and probably the main reason I can credit with our success today, is basically we became a purposeful company. And that happened because everyone that works at Archidic, you can ask everyone from someone in South Africa, an engineer in Bangladesh, the US or the UK, uh, they, will tell us, they will tell you the same thing. They are working at Archidic because they believe that they are doing the best that they possibly can to leave a better planet for, the, for their children. And that Archidic truly puts sustainability in the heart of everything it does. And many people say this, but there are few companies who actually do this. And when you do it, 
it's immediately recognized, of course. This is why we lead the Dow Jones Sustainability Index globally in sustainability. This is why we were one of 45 businesses worldwide and the only one from emerging markets that I know of or in our uh, industry that got awarded the Terra Carta seal by uh, His Royal Highness, uh, Prince Charles, and uh, his charity. Uh, these recognitions are important because, of course, they also help you with advancing your brand and your product is the most sustainable product. Now, how did we do this? Basically, uh, we had a two degree scenario. So the world is going, it's divided businesses, governments into several categories. One category is uh, aiming for a two degree warmer world uh, by 2100. One category is aiming for a 1.5 degree scenario. And we already said, I already mentioned that a two degree world is not a livable world. Uh, we originally had our science-based targets initiative approved for a two-degree uh, world, but we basically did an exercise where we said, okay, let's go 10 years into the future and look back. Did we do everything that we possibly could at that time? And we saw that we, sim we simply saw that we hadn't. So we decided to commit to a 1.5 degree uh, scenario. Uh, <laughs> this was this is easier said than done, by the way, because the technologies to do that today in our industry doesn't exist. We basically produce appliances that consume energy in the market and for a long life cycle and cause emissions for a long life cycle. Um, I have to go into a little bit of a technical detail here, but I think I, if you only take away this from this talk, I'm still very happy uh, of the time I've committed. Now, there are three types of emissions. Scope one and scope two are emissions which are directly caused by your production processes, and uh, which is important, right? Archidic is carbon neutral in, in these scope one and scope two emissions across the globe in all its manufacturing uh, facilities. Now, this is, this is impressive. We pat ourselves on the back. By the way, there's no one else. Uh, there are other companies who, who are carbon neutral, but they do it by buying carbon credits. Um, at the opening introduction, what you heard uh, was that we actually created our own carbon credits. This is a very important distinction. I won't go into too much detail, but actually uh, becoming carbon neutral in scope one and two emissions means you're really cutting down your emissions in every way you can. I'll give you an example. We've basically become a power company. We've installed 50 megawatts or installing 50 megawatts of solar power across all our roofs in the, in the globe to produce our own power to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, uh, and of course, it's a little bit of a distraction from our main business, but it's something we have to do and it shows our commitment to decarbonizing the company. Now, there's something called scope three emissions, which is very important. Scope three emissions are what the consumer causes in emissions when using your products in its lifetime. So if I sell a refrigerator and the customer buys it, the energy consumed by that refrigerator in the lifetime of the product in the consumer's home causes emissions. Now, <clears throat> I told you we were patting ourselves on the back because we were carbon neutral in scope one and two emissions. Well, guess what? Scope one and two emissions are only 2% of, uh, of RGX emissions, only 2%. Scope three emissions are 98% of RGX emissions. So it's clear that we need to impact scope three emissions. Um, unfortunately, this is where old CEOs globally go quiet. When you look at the MSCI, uh, uh, there was an MS MSCI in investigation showing, imagine this is all public companies across the world. Only 15% of these companies uh, basically measured and disclosed part of their scope three emissions. None of them measured, I mean, the rest don't even measure their scope three emissions, let alone set targets. Uh, this is, I'll tell you why this is so important. So we have... Uh, uh, now we have committed by 2030 to reduce our scope three emissions as well by 50%. Uh, this, is, this is a huge number. Uh, technologies to do this, by the way, doesn't exist today. Uh, so we are saying basically we will invest in technologies, in R&D, in innovation. And that's why we need you uh, as engineers to come into Archidic and create these technologies. Um, uh, we've committed that, that 50%, and I'll tell you why it's important again, if we manage to reduce our scope to emissions by 50%, it means 11.5 million tons of carbon emissions averted. 11.5 million tons of carbon emissions, by the way, is equal to the annual emissions of the country of Croatia. 
So uh, I often use this example, and my colleagues uh, hate when I do it because it's naming a company. But Patagonia, we all love, right? They make great outdoor uh, wear. They're expensive, but they're very, very nature and climate conscious. But they're tiny. So ultimately, the impact they have is very, very small. Uh, what it needs is companies like Archeric dramatically attacking this Pandora's box of scope three emissions and uh, having impact at scale. So um, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm going into too much detail and boring you here, but I think this is the important part. There's so much talk about what's going on around decarbonization. You have to be real about what's going to have impact. And you yourselves have to be able to differentiate who is doing something, really doing something which will have impact, and who is just talking about it. This is your responsibility. And I'm just trying to give you a couple of tools which will raise your awareness. Here's something else which is very, very important. The whole fight about uh, you know, coal-fired power plants and uh, uh, what's going to happen with them. And you know, Turkey, for example, as it has some very, very low-yielding, energy-yielding coal, uh, we are destroying our nature in Turkey to be able to keep the coal-fired power plants uh, going. And we're importing also low-yield coal. And it, it really, we need to get out of coal as a country because we also have a net zero commitment by 2053. So um, now, instead of thinking of, of new technologies like carbon capture, uh, you know, attacking things which are very uh, capex uh, or capital intensive, there's a very simple solution. If you take four product, product groups, uh, motors, air conditioners, refrigerators, and lighting, just these four product categories, you're looking at about 40% of global energy consumption, 40%. If we were to take today's technologies that are available in terms of energy efficiency and apply them, what do I mean by that? If your refrigerator or your air conditioner at home was the highest energy level that required the least amount of energy to run, we would basically, um, uh, we would basically reduce energy consumption by more than 4,000 600 terawatt hours. And you know that's equivalent to shutting down 2,100 coal-fired uh, power plants. This data comes from the International Energy Agency. My friend Fatih Birol is a big advocate of this. He calls it the first energy because we're all focused on nuclear, hydrogen technologies which don't exist today. If we just applied energy efficiency technologies to these four categories, we would get rid of coal altogether. And uh, so we need to really, as consumers also, responsibly choose uh, the products uh, that we're using. I mean, for example, heating and cooling has to be done by heat pumps. It's a new business area. You know, it's going to, um, it's going to reduce basically the, the carbon footprint caused by heating and cooling uh, by half, at least. So this is probably why, as you notice, two of the categories there are the industry we're in, uh, as Archeric, air conditioning and uh, refrigeration, also electric motors, by the way. So we're in every one of those industries, except lighting. Um, that's why we have <coughs> uh, um, uh, such an important responsibility. And that's why what we're doing, uh, promising to reduce by 50% in 2030, um, we, we are leading by example for all the other businesses out there. If you look at what we've done in the past, by the way, because I don't like companies that just promise and don't talk about their track records, we have managed to reduce our energy consumption in washing machines by 42% and dishwashers by 36%. There's a very clear global aspect to the race to net zero. And um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Europe is a great example. Uh, and I often call the Green Deal a great deal because it really is a good deal. Uh, but Europe is only 8% of global emissions. So Europe can only really be an example. Uh, it can be nothing uh, but an example, but a good example. So Archid is trying to be uh, a good example uh, as well. Now, uh, of course, decarbonizing itself is not enough. Uh, the circular economy is important. We are uh, increasing the amount of uh, recycled materials in our uh, products by up to 40%, which is quite dramatic. Today, uh, it's around, I think, 5 to 6%. We're using discarded fishing nets. We're using uh, discarded water bottles, pet bottles in our production products. Uh, and also, um, when we, uh, I mean, you're all familiar with uh, what we call changing campaigns, uh, where we offer a new product in exchange for taking your old product back. 
In the past, that old product would end up in a landfill. Well, today, uh, because that was the case, and we couldn't find anyone to replace, uh, to recycle them, we built our own recycling facilities. We have two of them. They are these Mad Max style giant buildings, you know, 40 meter high. They basically chew up the machines. And brand agnostic, when we sell you a new machine, we'll take the old one back. It doesn't matter what brand it is. And we will recycle it. Up to date, we have recycled 1.5 million units. That's a huge number of units that normally would go to the trash dump that get completely recycled. And we take the recycled material from there and we use it in our new products. This is extremely important because what it does, it um, also saves the energy consumed and the emissions caused when those materials are being produced, the steel, the plastic. Uh, and this is, a, this is also uh, incredibly important for companies to really change the way they operate. I mean, for example, the water we use in our production processes, we now mostly, and it's going to be all by the way soon, we, uh, we filter and reuse. So we're actually going to close loop systems rather than continuously using clean water, polluting it and dumping it. Um, and this kind of behavior can no longer go on and regulation actually needs to follow. How can we succeed uh, with a net zero uh, future? Uh, this is not an easy task. It's, um, it's going to take uh, a long time. It's going to take uh, a lot of effort. Uh, but I believe uh, that the money, uh, some estimates say $270 trillion of cumulative spending on physical assets are needed, by the way, in the next three decades. And this is a mind-blowingly huge number. Uh, if you look at that annually, we would need to allocate about $9 trillion a year. This is a McKinsey study, by the way. So I'm quoting them, um, uh, a year to actually uh, get to global uh, net zero. Of course, along the way, there will be technologies that come, and I'm a big believer in technology that will shorten this, uh, uh, that will lessen this amount and probably help to become uh, net zero. But in a uh, inflationary rising interest rate environment, it's becoming very difficult for governments and financial institution, institutions to provide these incentives to companies to actually allocate these funds. And uh, I'm, I'm personally uh, thinking that, as you saw with the ESG funds, anybody that doubles down today on alternative energy and decarbonizing their businesses will be rewarded hugely. Uh, but in the meantime, to get to net zero, we need to electrify everything. There can be no longer gas in the home. There can be no longer gas in our cars, in our trucks. Uh, our heating and cooling systems need to be electrified. Uh, we need to go solar everywhere, especially in Turkey. It is ridiculous that we don't have solar panels on every roof. It is just simply ridiculous. Uh, the payback is today under three years, as far as I can see. And uh, it would rapidly help towards decarbonizing uh, the country. Uh, also, uh, basically, not only uh, um, uh, if this isn't done, by the way, what we are seeing today um, is that the carbon price is becoming a factor. Very soon, uh, we will see the cost of carbon implemented into products and services. In today's world, where carbon price is below 50, it doesn't matter, right? Uh, and it will put us on a route to 2.4 degrees. But how about if you calculate a 200 euro carbon price or a 500 euro carbon price. What happens to the price of products and services? This is what companies need to think about. So if you want to hedge against that future, basically where you become priced out, you need to immediately uh, take action and hedge your bets against the coming cost of being a polluting uh, company. Now, um, I'm trying to run through fast across a very broad spectrum of uh, what the impact is, is but um, a little bit about climate leadership. Basically, my personal journey um, uh, is um, uh, very much linked with uh, what we have um, uh, what we have done at Archeric. Uh, I have tried desperately <laughs> at times and uh, climbing Everest and writing a book uh, to uh, raise awareness and uh, impact. Uh, by the way, the book is also available in, in Turkish. It's, it's called Tehlikeli uh, Tırmanış. 
uh, and is available in audio and Kindle and every, every, but if you prefer the English version, it's a little bit less edited if you, or didacted, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, basically, you have to live uh, what you're preaching. There's no other way forward. And to do that, you have to, uh, uh, servant leadership is very, very critical. Uh, there is no more the star CEO of the past. Young people only want to work with leaders who empower the communities, the employees, the customers, and actually look to create value beyond money and fame. And this has to be authentic. Uh, so essentially climate activism today is something that resonates uh, very much uh, with young people. And essentially, uh, a few years back when I was at a crossroad and really uh, struggling with how I would understand and um, uh, how I would understand and help these young people and the company uh, that I work for and the platform that I manage to rapidly decarbonize and, and raise awareness. So I actually uh, got out of my comfort zone and I have three young children. Uh, to many people, they would ask why. Would I take that risk? Uh, it looks like I have a, a great job, CEO of the most international company in Turkey, a young family. But essentially taking that risk gave me the credibility and the authenticity as a leader because I was doing it for the right reasons, not to um, beat on my chest and be proud that I've climbed Everest. I'm lucky that I survived and I came back. But in the process of getting ready, basically we managed to teach everybody about sustainability and it really accelerated our transformation into a, a purposeful uh, company. Now, um, what I tried to do in the book also, as today I've spoken only about sustainability, I see some of you are looking at your phones, doing your emails. This is perfectly understandable. It's a difficult topic. It's, uh, it's abstract. It feels like it's in the future. Uh, so by actually weaving in the story of Everest, I'm able to get everyone's attention. And people that read the book really learn a lot because I've, I've uh, interviewed more than 100 subject matter experts, and I've integrated what they are saying about the hope and the solutions um, uh, about uh, what it is. Now, um, uh, I've, I've, I've talked at many events uh, like this uh, with young people like yourselves, and uh, uh, I, I, I have to, uh, I, I hope I was not uh, um, too dark in, or pessimistic in, in what I conveyed to you. Uh, but uh, what I have heard from younger people, uh, Clover was one of them, actually, a very smart woman, very young. I think she was 20 or 21, articulate, smart, well-versed, uh, well-studied, and uh, she was angry, uh, climate activist, very angry, because basically she feels young people, as I mentioned at the start of my talk, have been completely locked out of the decision-making process. I think what you need to do is you have to ask very, very difficult questions. You have to really understand what the issues are. You have to understand what the solutions are, and you have to become somewhat skilled in these uh, factors so that whatever job you go out there, uh, you can make a difference and really, really actually help create a better quality of life uh, and a more sustained way of living for yourselves in the future, and especially uh, if you know, more than you also, your children. Uh, it's, it's incredibly important that you're curious, you ask questions, you become aware of facts, and you can challenge, uh, you can challenge any leadership uh, on these topics. But more importantly, you can impact by transforming your lives, transforming the way you consume, transforming the way you eat, transforming the way you uh, essentially heat and cool your house. There are so many things you can do, transforming the way you travel even, uh, but then also applying all of this to whatever job uh, you end up doing out there in, the, in this very difficult geopolitical and economical environment. Believe me when I say that when I interview people, um, <clears throat> climate, understanding of the climate, understanding what decarbonization means is now a serious factor uh, and a part of an important part of our decision-making uh, process. Uh, I want to leave you with one uh, timeline when I say 2030, everybody feels it's abstract, right? We're in 2022, it's quite far away. I just want to leave with you that it's now less than 400 weeks away, 400 weeks. And uh, for me, this is striking because at RGD, we, get a, we do a weekly report on what we have done that week to decarbonize the company because we have a clock ticking 
with the number of weeks left to 2030, which keeps it real and keeps it current uh, for everybody here. Uh, it's shockingly close. 400 weeks is nothing. Uh, so please, all of you, uh, really take a moment to think about this and take a moment to think about what you can do yourselves in your daily lives to contribute to this fight. Uh, I want to thank uh, the Bill Kent University, our honorable uh, rector, and also, of course, Refet, my friend, for this uh, invitation and opportunity to talk. And to all of you uh, for listening to me. Hopefully, I didn't bore you uh, too much. Now, I left some time for Q&A. It's totally, I have to leave uh, uh, uh, at least seven or eight minutes to the hour. Uh, so we can use the next 10, 10, 15 minutes maximum for Q&A. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much for wonderful uh, talk, um, informative as well as uh, being inspiring. Thank you also for agreeing to uh, record this. Uh, our classes are so, still continuing, so some students cannot be with us, but we'll share the recording with them uh, so that they can also uh, benefit from this. Thank you for agreeing to uh, take questions as well. Now the floor is open for uh, questions. Yeah. Sorry, no, I mean, I, it's better if you, if you mediate, yeah. Okay, shall I, or may I uh, go first? Very good. Um, this was wonderful, thank you. Um, let me ask you this. Um, at the very beginning when you talked about, you know, consumers care about this um, and elsewhere, um, there was this explicit um, understanding that, um, you know, mining sustainability is good for business. Uh, you had a very nice interview on CNN a few we weeks ago where you articulate this even more clearly, right? Uh, that sustain mining sustainability makes a business. Um, it, it, that's why the profits are going to be in the end anyway. Um, and I hope that that's the case. But this is one place where uh, then incentives overlap nicely when you don't really face a trade-off. Right, uh, mining sustainability is not expensive for the business. I think this is clearest in the case where uh, you're talking about recycling, right? Um, because of the things that contribute to sustainability, recycling is the one that is um, most business friendly because you know you're getting a cheap input in a sense, um, and you are selling a replacement. Now, <clears throat> the three R's, of course, are reduce, reuse, recycle. And the one that has the largest impact is the reduce bit. Don't go out and buy the thing to begin with. Don't make it uh, be produced at the get-go and you won't have to worry about sustainability either. You know, following up from your example, I live in Ankara. Uh, I don't have an air conditioner at home because you know, this isn't India. Um, uh, it, you know, one week a year uh, is too hot, but yeah, so be it. But that line of reasoning and pushing that bit um, isn't as business friendly, right? So the question here is, what is your take on how businesses should approach these questions when we, when we use up the obviously business friendly bits, when the overlap between sustainability and good business overlap between sustainability and profits yeah, are I, um, exploited and, and we have to actually, actually give up something to be more yeah. sustainable? I understand, I understand perfectly what you're coming to. And, uh, you know, there the, are the, the two actually uh, baselines we, we have to agree to. One, uh, uh, something not very uh, looked at is basically the impact of the climate is going to reduce global growth rates dramatically. So we're looking at less consumption anyway. We're probably looking at, at, at negative rates uh, uh, later in uh, these developments because essentially... The, the, the cost caused by climate uh, change is going to be so severe that uh, it's going to limit growth and consumption. I think as businesses, uh, once we've gone through the low-hanging fruit, uh, durability will be key. In my industry, uh, replacing a 10-year-old appliance makes total sense and goes against logic, right? An appliance should have a much longer life cycle, should be repairable. But essentially, a, a, a refrigerator today consumes maybe 30% of the energy it consumed uh, 10 years ago. So we need to replace all of them in the market, considering that we, re we recycle what we're taking off, uh, off the plate. Now, uh, this is going to be very difficult because, you know, this continuous growth model that we live with, and this is something much more uh, in your plate, uh, 
um, is not sustainable. Uh, but uh, I believe that the opportunities in decarbonizing and new technologies and carbon capture and climate related new businesses are actually going to make up for the loss of GDP uh, created uh, with consumption models. Uh, and as, you know, I, I commend you for not buying an air conditioning in Ankara. You don't need it. I buy an air conditioning, but I also put solar panels on the roof. So I produce all the energy that I use. I feel good about the air conditioning I use because I am carbon neutral in my home. Uh, this is possible for everyone. And it really, I think, is going to, once people are more aware of the impact uh, of what's waiting for us, people will, will act quite uh, differently. Um, in the interest of time, can I, Panaranam, can I do this? Uh, Anne-Marie? Um, it's wonderful to, to have this talk. Um, I will seriously consider buying Archelic from now on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, now, you talked about um, the sustainability uh, index, and I wondered, could there be one for universities? Could there be a sustainability index for universities? I mean, I, uh, Beko, we, um, we, we um, uh, donated an innovation lab for Marlborough, which is a high school in, in, in the UK, and I made sure that that was completely sustainable, carbon neutral. Absolutely. There's so much you can do in the university. I mean, you know, for, you have to get rid of all single use plastics. You need to get rid of what you're selling in the canteens. You need to uh, change your heating and cooling, your insulation of your buildings. The, you can become completely paperless. You can install solar panels. Uh, there are so many things you can do. And uh, you can capture rainwater. You know, you can, uh, you can recycle your wastewater. It, it just doesn't end. And uh, you can change the, the, the vegetation you have on your grounds. Uh, and yes, absolutely, there should be one. Of course, uh, the Dow Jones is a, is a publicly listed company index. It's taken very seriously. and There's no such list for universities. But trust me, there will come a list talking about the more sustainable uh, universities. And it's not just teaching sustainability. It's living in a sustainable manner. And this will be, uh, this will be one of the reasons for students to choose. The, um, the university, our rector explained, um, ha has made some very real um, uh, progress and taken some very real initiatives. And I think that uh, once Bill Kent starts to feel good about, the, uh, about accelerating these actions, then uh, I think that more will follow uh, and that will Great. be more beneficial. Music uh, my ears. I mean, one thing that can immediately happen, for example, does Bill Kent buy its power from renewables? I mean, this is very available and possible today in Turkey. Bilkan should be buying all of its energy consumption from renewables. Uh, Adnan Bey? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the talk. Um, two questions. One is, is there one specific technology that can help Archili to reach its sustainability goals? Uh, let me have the second question as well, if it's okay. Okay, sure. The other one is, how easy do you think it is to transfer the Archelic model of sustainability and business to other sectors? Yeah. Um, uh, there is no one technology. Uh, energy efficiency is extremely key for us because, um, as I mentioned, when we've committed to cutting scope three emissions by 50%, that technology doesn't exist today, but it's energy efficiency. So we need to work on uh, principles like the boil cycle, which is 100 plus years old, and actually try to refine them to make them much less energy consuming. And this is where all our focus is. Uh, I mean, we, we have 1,600 engineers um, working tirelessly around sustainability. This is one of the biggest advantages Turkey, Turkey has, by the way. We have uh, a, a very dedicated, a very um, hardworking uh, uh, human capital and that is not available to our competitors. And this is actually what's allowing us to differentiate the investment in R&D innovation. Uh, and with the focus in these new technologies, I think we will further differentiate. And when I say we differentiate, we differentiate from brands that you think should be the best technology, BSH, Miele, I don't care who you name, we are better than them. Um, and, and this is because of the human capital. Is Archidic's uh, story repeatable across industries? Absolutely. I mean, what we're doing is not rocket science. We're doing... We're basically looking at every process we have in a different way. And when you do that, and people really believe it, uh, and they believe in the leadership, this is important. You know, you have to live by example. You can't be a hypocrite, and, uh, and, and you need to really mean it. Um, and I think our entire 
leadership is focused on this enough that the teams believe it, uh, you will start transforming. I mean, every production process can cut its carbon emissions by 30, 40%, I believe, in every industry. And waste can be treated completely differently uh, across industries. It's not easy. For example, when we needed a certain type of uh, plastic recycled, uh, we found that the recy recycling companies in, uh, that we could access in our supply chain were actually washing the plastic parts with incredible amounts of water and then dumping it into the oceans. And I mean, you know, you need to be very aware of cause and effect. We immediately stopped that and got one of our suppliers to invest in a newer technology, which was cleaner. So you need to be aware of what you're doing, not pass the problem down into another problem. But absolutely, it's repeatable across industries. Uh, you can. Uh, thank you uh, for your great talk. Uh, I think for uh, carbon reduction policies and in general sustainability, the legal policies are very uh, and measures are very important. You as Archeric are uh, doing really very well in this respect, but uh, do you have any collaboration or any, uh, you know, uh, pushing yeah. towards the uh, legal measures as well? Yeah, I, I just got elected um, uh, to head the European uh, Appliance Manufacturers uh, uh, Association, where it's called APLIA, uh, with a very narrow margin. I think it was 11 to 10 votes. The reason there is they know that I'm going to push a very aggressive sustainability agenda for the industry uh, at the EU. Uh, now, I joke with the MPs when I go there. I say, you know, you're not letting us into the European Union anytime soon, but we just came in the back door. You have a Turkish company running the European Association for Appliance Manufacturers, which uh, is something we're very proud of. Actually, this happened because of our sustainability credentials, right? Most people around the world expect a Swedish or a German or an American company to lead in this field, but it's a company coming from an emerging market. This is incredibly important. Why? Because this battle is going to be won in places like Pakistan, Bangladesh, India, where there's no regulation. Archeric has taken the stance that we will push for regulation and lobby for regulation. This is very unusual. Business leaders usually, uh, you know, fight regulation in every way. And, uh, and of course, this is, a very, this is difficult for the industry to, to digest, uh, but it's happening. And it's, uh, it, it's going to take time. It's not easy because getting unanimity is very difficult. Some companies are more prepared than others. But what's clear is Turkey's place is with the EU, whether... You know, it doesn't matter who wants it or not. That is geopolitically the case. There is huge amount of investment in Turkey, the infrastructures uh, there. So Turkey needs to harmonize itself with regulation in Europe. And we are very much for this. We communicate with the government very frequently. We are helping with the blueprint uh, plans. We were very delayed in ratifying the Paris Agreement, which was a big risk for us. Um, it could collapse our industry, actually, with, uh, with carbon taxes, which are called CBAN. Uh, and that's what really triggered our, our signing of the treaty. But also we've committed to a net zero uh, future. Now what we have to do is we have to really uh, fill this up. And we're doing, you know, in many aspects, Turkey is doing quite well. Renewables are going well. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of, uh, of work to do. So as Archidik, uh, we are doing our part in uh, working with government to ensure that regulations help this decarbonization. But not only in Turkey, right, in Bangladesh, in Pakistan, uh, across the world. Thank you so much for the question. Uh, there's one on the chat. Okay, last question. Yasemin uh, Thank you, Hakan Bey, for this presentation. Uh, actually, it is very obvious your efforts and implications in markets and in technological terms. I would like to ask your uh, efforts or uh, strategic plans in social sustainability. Why I am asking this question is last year we worked with your RG department and we created human-centered uh, user interfaces as interior architecture department. And it was a great opportunity for our students to increase their pro-environmental behaviors. So uh, since humans are user your appliances, uh, I would like to learn uh, your um, uh, minds or uh, comments on this issue. I mean, we do a lot of things, right? Um, uh, this is going to sound controversial and we're recorded, but I'm still going to say it because Refet is here and you won't have it any other way. Um, look, ESG obviously encompasses sustainability. It encompasses everything that's social as well. We're talking about gender equality, 
uh, racial equality, child labor. There are so many things that encompass uh, accessibility. I mean, it's a very, very long list. And today, sustainability, uh, basically vetting companies or NGOs like Sustainalytics, which are very difficult, by the way, who come and analyze your business and give you basically a score on how you're doing, which determines your rating worldwide, which determines your borrowing cost. It determines your share price. There's so many things that it impacts. Uh, has a lot of this social aspect built in. Um, I believe that, of course, all of this is incredibly important. And I can't put it below uh, any one other thing. But to tell you the truth, the climate and decarbonizing part of that, the sustainability part of that is so much more urgent that it's taking away both capital and attention from the climate to focus on supply chain in places where you have very little impact. I understand that we have to do all of it at the same time. I'm not against it, but we absolutely have to prioritize in one area. So actually, we have prioritized totally on sustainability. Now, <clears throat> that again, doesn't mean we're not doing uh, all of our social uh, responsibilities or taking them seriously. We have to because rating agencies rate us with those results. But I would be more comfortable if we were allowed to prioritize more freely. Um, so to the answer to, the, to your question, I think you specifically wanted to talk about user interfaces and what we're doing, for example, for blind people, uh, for people with uh, learning disabilities. Uh, we're doing a lot of work there uh, and we're collaborating with uh, all the universities uh, that are out there in Turkey that are interested because uh, we believe that access, as I told you earlier, is, is important. So we're working on voice activated appliances today. Uh, you know, we, we have many, many products coming up. In fact, on my business card, I have Braille. It's the only business card I've seen so that blind people can read the business card. Uh, it's a nice touch. I mean, I haven't given it to any blind people yet, but it's actually a statement, if you understand what I mean. So, um, uh, yeah, we are doing a lot. Uh, but what I did want to stress with your question is something I want to uh, make clear is that uh, it's impossible for a business to focus on all of these things at the same time, Right. And the world is facing a major crisis. And this is why this is a sustainability year at Bilkent. Uh, it's not a gender equality year. It's not an equal access year. It's not a, this is, this is mission critical, right? If we don't get this right, not, nothing else really matters. Uh, because uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and put it into terms uh, that are very clear. My growing up, I valued experiences. I, I don't like cars or, what, you know, experiences for me, travel, um, you know, I never worried about the food I'm going to eat or the house I'm going to live in. Okay, maybe I want a nicer house with solar panels, but that's it. The new generation coming out now, my children, you know, they're nine, seven, and five, may not have food security. They may not have a roof to put their heads under. That's how severe the problem could be. So I like, I, I, I don't like it when the sustainability message gets totally distra distracted and diluted with all the other uh, ESG parameters. And I'm a contrarian in that. Thank you very much. If you allow me. Uh... We will L allow me to thank you uh, quickly, um, Hakan Bey, both for uh, what you are doing at Archirik and for uh, your wonderful presentation and your contribution. This was excellent and inspiring. Uh, and it's going to give us a lot of uh, teachable bits uh, for the years to come. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for listening. Oh, thank you, Refat Hujam, for facilitating uh, Hakan Bey's contribution as well. I've got quite a bit to share with you as well uh, from our faculties, contributions from our uh, colleagues and, and, and students. Uh, what we've decided to do was to um, um, invite them to submit short videos to highlight what they have done over the past year. So we're going to watch them um, in order of uh, in which they, I, I have received their Increase contributions. Create visibility and promote creativity while, while aiming for a greener future. As the law. Okay, I'll try again. This should work better. To increase awareness on sustainability and climate crisis, create visibility and promote creativity while aiming for a greener future. As the law faculty and sustainability faculty representatives, we initiated a project called the Green Scene. 
The Green Team is a short video project to provide our students and the members of the BigCamp community to open platform to share their personal experience, daily habits, research or ideas with one minute long videos and interviews. Here are some contributions. Hello everyone, my name is Gökberk Katılcı and I'm a PhD candidate in Brekulgus Electrochemistry Research Lab. In terms of sustainability, we are characterizing the batteries in terms of their high energy density in smaller volumes. In this part of our lab, we are measuring temperature dependent electrochemical impedance spectroscopy of various battery types to understand and develop a better and more high performance batteries. Merhaba, benim adım Emel Özdöre Akşak. Bilkent Üniversitesi İletişim Tasarım Bölümünde öğretim üyesiyim. Ee, bu yıl böyle bana bir farkındalık geldi ve bir anda ne kadar çok evde aslında biyolojik atık çöpe attığımızı fark ettim. Ee, i̇şte yumurta kabukları, kahve filtreleri, kahvenin artıkları, ondan sonra işte böyle tohumlu şeyler, domatesler, işte kestiğimiz salatalıklar, ondan sonra meyveler, elma çekirdekleri falan. Ben daha çok hani ağaçlara bir besin, bir gübre olsun. İşte çöpler bu çöp toplama merkezlerine gitmesin boş boşuna biyolojik atıklar ve doğaya geri dönsün aslında amacım o. Over the past few years, I've been changing my lifestyle to fit to a more sustainable future. This all begins in the bedroom where I've set my alarm earlier so that I can walk to school instead of drive. What's this? Wait, it's so early. I think I'm a minimalist, so I limit myself to, uh, of course I am also a foreigner here, so I fly back to uh, the Netherlands where I'm from a couple of times a year. I think that's okay because you need to see your family, but I try to do it as little as possible and do all my professional things inside that same trip so that I'm not constantly flying up and down to different, uh, to different places. I currently carry my own water bottle, but I would like to have a thermos and contain it everywhere. So. It doesn't cause many uh, environment corruption because of the plastic that's being wasted. Um, for instance, I don't really buy many things. I don't change my, for instance, electronic components, my phone. I, I don't change my phones regularly. Or I contribute to uh, projects such as electric car projects. I try less to buy plastic products. And if I do have any plastic products, I try to reuse them as much as I can. Uh, if I have the option to use uh, like cardboard or something else instead of plastic, I try to take that option instead of the plastic. I am collecting um, papers and um, take them to uh, paper bins. So when I'm in the kitchen, I try to generate like um, the least amount of waste possible. I try not to throw away anything, you know, whether it's like, um, you know, fruit peels, etc. You, you know, um, animal bones. I just try to make use of them. I'm telling you this because everybody's individual action will help to accumulate and stop this ecological disaster. Okay. Um, so thank you, Talia Hocam, uh, for organizing this, and we've received help from our communication and design department uh, with the editing as well. The next contribution is coming from a uh, faculty of uh, music. Hi. My name is Olur Yıldırım, and I'm the sustainability representative for the Faculty of Music and Performing Arts. I'd like to briefly talk about the sustainability theme sound installation exhibition we have organized and share some audiovisual excerpts from the sound minute works. In our call for sound installations, we have asked for works that engage with topics such as ecology, climate change, recycling, and sustainability. The title we picked for the project is Resync. Syncing or synchronizing is a term we frequently use in music and audio. And in the context of our project, the term resync loosely refers to resynchronization with the environment. One of the goals we set for the project was to raise awareness among the members of the Beacon community. Accordingly, uh, the sound installations would preferably be all around the Beacon campus, and works uh, that incorporate or interact with the soundscape of our campus were particularly encouraged. We also did not limit the submissions to a specific medium, so uh, the works cover a lot of ground in regard to the media, style, and tools used. 
Some examples include uh, a sound walk that invites participants to follow a specific route across the campus and pay attention to uh, elements of the soundscape that might otherwise be overlooked. Um, another example is a, is a piece written for players performing on discarded spring coils from a car's engine. Um, and another one is an outdoors uh, sound sculpture that uses plates made from recycled home plastic waste. Um, we have a performance piece where players situated around Bilkent Lake interact with the soundscape by performing conventional or DIY instruments. Um, and then we have a virtual reality experience uh, in which the participant needs to find their way through a landscape where smartphones and missiles fall from the sky. And finally, um, a site-specific work to be exhibited in the Beacon Greenhouse that highlights uh, the, green, uh, the increasing level of urban uh, noise pollution and its adverse effects on the ecosystem and human cognition. You may find more information about these works on our website. Um, I now would like to share um, some short snippets and teasers of some of the submitted works. But please note that uh, since most of these works were designed to be experienced in person, the audiovisual uh, documentation doesn't really uh, do them justice. So we invite all of you to see and hear the sound installations in person when they're exhibited um, over the next few weeks. Thank you. Thank you, Odo, for his colleagues, to his colleagues and students at music faculty uh, for this contribution. Our final video is coming from the Faculty of Humanities. Our colleague, uh, Joshua Hoja, has organized a poetry competition, which he's not going to tell us about, and the winners are going to recite their po poems as well. Hello, I'm Dr. Joshua Bartlett, Assistant Professor in the Department of American Culture and Literature. As part of Bill Kent's Year of Sustainability, students were invited to participate in a poetry competition designed to raise awareness of environmental issues and celebrate the elements of nature that surround us every day on the Bill Kent campus. We received wonderful entries from students across departments, and I want to thank all those who participated. I also want to thank Dr. Jonathan Williams from the Department of English Language and Literature and Dr. Talia Dybul from the Faculty of Law for their help in judging the entries. Our three prize winners have each provided a recitation of their award-winning poem, which you'll enjoy following this announcement. And you'll also find them on the sustainability website in the near future. It gives me great pleasure to announce the following winners of the Nature of Bill Kent Poetry Competition. First prize is awarded to Umut Mart Karajalu for his poem, A Familiar Place. Second prize is awarded to a poet who has chosen to remain anonymous for their poem, May Most Auspicious. Third prize is awarded to Marich Selene Oljai for her poem, The Bench That Overlooked the Library. Please join me in congratulating our poets and in appreciating their thoughtful and elegant work. Thank you. My name is Mutmat Karajola. I'm a third year chemistry student, and this is my poem, A Familiar Place. 
I know this place. It is where the birds sound like they made a very long trip, from tropical jungles all the way here. It is where a cat made a stump its pedestal, where another stands like a statue, waiting to get its daily petting. Where flowers bloom in an instant, just like the people in it, impatient to feel the sun, the rays that were gone for many months. Where the wind may carry the most beautiful melody, or cut you like a knife, cold penetrating deep into your heart. It is where the snow falls first, way before the townsfolk get to see it. Where dandelions make sure it snows even when winter's long gone. It is where joyous voices bring the spring, as people fill the grasslands at the first instant of warmth. It is here that I was enchanted by the sweetest melody or isgi for et eternity. You know this place too, don't you? Thank you. May most auspicious. The ether is alive. A thousand lights dance within it. All I am is an open eye, saluting the time-traveled gift, drinking the sight, and at last drunk. After an exam I've taken, like a moonlight-driven monk, I know the pinkish petals do ascend when golden, and the seasons wither as the turning of beads. I am forever praying to never crush the ends, and with mindful steps returning, and may most auspicious to my studies. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in for this great event today. My name is Mircea Noljai, and I'm currently a third year student in international relations. Before moving on with my poem, I'd also like to congratulate my peers for achieving their great results in this competition. My poem is showcasing how the campus and its natural environment has had an impact on my emotional mindset, despite COVID being so persistent throughout my uh, educational life. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy my poem and I hope you enjoy my recitation for it. The bench that overlooked the library. Other people, other places, over passing years, may make you forget about me, but I know you will never forget our spot, the bench that overlooked the library. For a simple, rusted bench, we gave quite the life to it. I realized my love for you there, and you kissed me under the blinding rain. Clandestine looks turned into caring stares, and for once, I felt like I belonged. With ivies on my fingertips, I became a mirror of the growing bushes beside us. And like the growing pine trees across the scenery, you stood tall, confident, both unaware of the coming winter. I cannot recall which was colder, your harsh words or the sun melting snow, or which one was crueler, the way I broke your heart versus the first biting wind. No apology was as sweet as the cherry blossoms we once picked out from my hair. As you left me at the time, I lost sad reflections of falling snow. My soul kept sitting on the idle bench. Moss grew over my dreary heart. Campus cats took their midday naps by my side. The willow tree with its generous shadow left my tears frozen on dull cheeks. I know you will never forget our spot because I know I never will. And though my words are futile, I foolishly hope your gaze lingers for a second more on that corner of echoing laughs and tears, while your lips curve for a longing smile, despite the years passing by. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, thank you, Joshua Hajam and his colleagues, of course, all, all our students who took part in this uh, poetry competition. Uh, as was said in the video, we're going to share uh, the winners on our uh, sustainability, Sustainable Weekend webpage as well. Uh, finally, I'm getting to research um, our, uh, our day job. Right? I received uh, detailed uh, contributions from our um, science, engineering, and arts and design architecture faculties outlining the kind of research 
um, that they're doing. I can't really by myself do justice to the substance of the important research that they're doing. But Bill Georgia from science faculty has prepared this slide for us outlining the important research that goes on in their faculty. Um, these projects are also shared on our website, including student projects. So you can have a look at them. You can um, also look at the um, publications that result uh, from uh, these research projects. So you can see that there's a lot that is already going on in our faculties, um, uh, in contributing to um, ideas and um, technologies uh, beyond the, uh, around sustainability. This is from science faculty, as I said. Here I have the contributions of engineering faculty. Thank you, Selin Hojan, for contributing this, outlining the kind of work that is going uh, ongoing in the faculty of engineering. As with science faculty, we have all of this information on our website already. You can learn more about these projects and their outputs, research outputs on our web page. I'll share this presentation on the web page as well so that you can take a greater, um, more detailed look at it if you wish afterwards. And finally, um, this is the research uh, projects that are ongoing in the Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture. Some of them finished, others are ongoing, as you can tell. When we began this uh, um, effort, we were very much impressed by the already uh, uh, uh, the immense effort that is already uh, ongoing in the university research-wise. Next, I am going to share with you um, a number of student projects that were shared with me over the past uh, few uh, weeks. This is a graduation pro project from Interior Architecture Environmental Design. Another project from the same department, another graduation project entitled The Most Sustainable Project. Very apt name. Two more that I received just yesterday. As you can see, our students are hard at work uh, contributing to our effort in terms of living sustainably on this planet. Of course, we kept on doing what we do best. We organized courses, offered new courses to help with the um, in efforts surrounding sustainability at Beacon. Here on the right-hand side, we have the web page where we list all of our sustainability-focused courses. On the left-hand side, you can see sample student projects for, from one of the dedicated courses. This is a business development, applied sustainable business development course offered by Aisha Hoja, Aisha Collins. And of course, I should also note the contributions by the fact, um, Department of Graphic Design. They've designed this logo on the upper left-hand side of the slide. And some of the posters that they designed for us. All of them are going to be available to you if they agree on our web page as well. You can see the, con the important contributions that our students have made over the past year. And very finally, I have the impressive number of seminars, workshops, conferences that we have organized throughout the semester. That's 70 plus. That means more than two activities uh, per week throughout the academic year. So I'd like to thank all of the faculties, our deans and department heads for organizing these. You can see that they keep happening. The, the, the, the, the one on the left-hand side is a or, uh, workshop organized by the Faculty of Business uh, Administration. That's already that's forthcoming. The one on the right-hand side is, is has happened last year from tourism faculty. And this is Toplum Saldriyar and the project data. Our students got involved uh, and contributed to our efforts surrounding sustainability as well. So uh, I'd like to once again thank everyone who was on the faculty representatives team for their effort um, for, um, and uh, throughout the year and contributing all this to our um, day of uh, sustainability 
at weekend as well. Thank you all for um, for coming and for being a part of this. We hope to be able to share um, this presentation uh, very soon um, so that students who are already in, uh, at the moment in class can also have a uh, taste of this. Thank you very much.